Um, but uh, I was uh, in Calgary for uh, just a just a short wee while. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> looking looking around and uh, it's a one. I mean, went up to Banff and let me tell you, I'll be back. <laughs> Good for you. I'll well, don't don't come back unless you get in touch with me. Absolutely. Well, I I will make a I'll make an absolute point of it. Absolutely. Good. I'll, I'll Good. definitely. So the same thing to David. I felt I actually felt quite guilty, but. Just been, as, as snuck, in and it, snuck in and out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I do that in the States all the time, and it drives my mother crazy. She's like, you came to the States, and you didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, I've been well, and uh, yeah, keeping well, considering the, the, the roller coaster of COVID. And, yes, um, that's been a little bit crazy, hasn't it? Yeah, well, hopefully it'll be behind us and we can look forward to many more great opportunities of moving sport and physical activity forward and upward. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's been fascinating to kind of take this journey in terms of organizing events, rescheduling events, uh, shifting yeah. schedules of events. <laughs> For sure. So, playing hardball sure. with other events. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's been interesting. Cool. Yeah. Turn it over to you, David. I think we probably get going here. Thank you all for being a part of it. So yeah, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eli. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, this is great. This is uh, this is pretty exciting for for us to to have our third uh, Stedward talks. And for those of you that don't know me, my name uh, is David Like. I'm a professor. Uh, in the Department of Health and Physical Education at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And these talks emerged initially, actually, I think Eli, you and I, when we met uh, at the UN, um, and we were, we were chatting there about the concept and idea, and then we, we reached out to Mary Humes, who's on this call and is gonna be part of this process, and then Ted Fay, who's another professor. So Mary's at the University of Louisville, Eli Wolf, who many of you know, uh, is at the University of Connecticut, among many other roles and responsibilities that he plays. And Ted Fay is a retired professor at the University of Massachusetts. And part of our motivation uh, and for the genesis of these talks was recognizing that perhaps there were stories left untold. Perhaps there was opportunities to have conversations and to look a bit more in depth into issues that are pertinent today, but yet we don't necessarily perhaps have the background or the context by which to fully understand them. And so it's similar to a fellow Canadians uh, podcast that I am a fan of, uh, Malcolm Gladwell um, and his revisionist history. And so part of what we're trying to do is to go back in the past and understand how it impacts the future. And so we've done two others. Uh, one was Dr. Stedward, who I'll introduce in a moment and was my advisor for my PhD at the University of Alberta and is the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee. And we talked about just that, the, the founding of the IPC as an organization. Then our second uh, involved Ted and a number of other colleagues where we looked at the factor system, mostly within Nordic skiing, um, but in other sports as well, and how that connected to the classification system and perhaps some of the challenges and issues that were involved in classification presently. Our third Stedward Talks is today. Um, and we've got a great lineup of speakers and moderators, and we're very, very um, excited, uh, excited to do this. So we do have three speakers, although one is a recorded message, um, and we have two live speakers, and Mary's going to do the moderating um, in the second half of this. But let me just very quickly introduce our speakers, and then we're going to get to the video from our very first. So again, we're looking at the inclusion within the Commonwealth Games. Um, which has a qu quite a long history. Many people don't know that there were paraplegic Commonwealth Games, which go back as early as 1962 and were held in Perth, Australia. And there was a time, and we'll talk about that when I uh, introduce Dr. Sedward, where there were paraplegic only uh, Commonwealth Games. And then there was a bit of a gap. And then uh, athletes with disabilities started being included in the Commonwealth Games uh, starting in around 1990. And we'll, we'll spend more time talking about that. So the three speakers that we have here with us today kind of run that gamut of the history of the Commonwealth Games and inclusion within it. 
So the first speaker who will be speaking uh, by a video message in a minute is uh, Rick Hansen, who many of you know as, a, as an advocate, a philanthropist, uh, particularly for persons with disabilities today, but also has a, a very storied background as an athlete. Uh, competed in the 1980 and 1984 Paralympic Games, and then also competed in the 1984 Olympic Games when wheelchair track was a demonstration status event. There were three Canadians in that one event, um, which was won by a Belgian, if I recall correctly. And I think an American got the silver medal. Um, although even we, you know, Canada did have three athletes competing. We didn't win the, the, the gold or the silver. Um, Hansen is then also infamous for having done his Man in Motion World Tour, um, where he raised funds for spinal cord injury research and he wheeled the equivalent of the circumference of the world and that took a two year two year period so he'll be speaking by video we'll show the video and then following that i'm going to have a chance to have a conversation with dr robert stedrid um, who is online here with us and as i've already mentioned is the founding president of the ipc and was intricately involved with the conversations and the negotiations of the inclusion of athletes with a disability into the commonwealth games and then rick hansen also had a role to play when the athletes were included in the 1994 games in Victoria, British Columbia in Canada. Our third speaker is uh, Mr. David Grevenberg, who's the CEO of Commonwealth Games Federation, uh, based now in London, UK, who's also the CEO of the 2014 Commonwealth Games um, when they were in Glasgow. And then previous to that, he was the executive director of sport for the International Paralympic Committee for, uh, for a number of years. So again, a very diverse uh, and interesting background in Paralympic and disability and now Commonwealth sports. So what we'll do is we'll start with the video from Rick Hansen. So Eli is gonna get that fired up. I'll then have a chance to talk to Dr. Sedward about some of those earlier days. And then I'll pass it over to Mary. who will then have a chance to talk with David about more kind of current status of inclusion in Commonwealth Games. Eli, if you can show the video, please. The sound. So sound. Okay. Uh, Eli, there's no sound on the video for me. The line between between disabled and able and really was just a focus on being I'm going to start again from the beginning. <laughs> Hi guys, it's Rick Hansen here. It's an honor to join this distinguished panel to be able to talk about the importance of the inclusion of athletes with disabilities in the Commonwealth Games. My role as an athlete uh, was varied and of course had a chance to participate in the first exhibition event in the Olympic Games in 1984 in Los Angeles. We had the men's 1500 meter wheelchair race along with the women's 800 meter. And it was a tremendous experience. It really helped to blur the line between disabled and able, and really was just a focus on being an athlete, representing your country, uh, being at a major games and being able to be part of the same team as uh, other athletes from other sports and disciplines. And, just be immersed in an athletic event. That impacted me deeply, and I thought that maybe one day I'd have the chance to follow my role model and mentor, Bob Stanford, and uh, maybe join somebody to help pay it forward and make a difference. Maybe even get to a place where full medal status would be achieved one day. Maybe the Olympics, maybe World Championships, maybe even the Commonwealth Games. And that's why I was so privileged, Bob, when you asked me as president of the IPC to join you to form a commission, a commission for the inclusion of athletes with disabilities into major multi-sport games. And that was uh, a revolutionary period to be able to know that it's really about serving athletes and giving athletes an opportunity to compete in a variety of places and locations and try to help see where sport becomes a mirror for how society views itself our values, our commitment to society, our recognition that people with disabilities are people first and they have ability to get past the stigmas that can often happen in uh, various labeled events. So 
when we started on the Commonwealth Games, Victoria here in British Columbia had the dream of being able to host the 1994 Commonwealth Games. And they actually responded when we asked them if they could actually host uh, an inclusion event, maybe an exhibition or full medal status. And they started the inquiry and the discussion and it was going to be a bit of a long haul, but uh, they decided that they would champion it as host committee, which was really important because without that, it would be impossible to be able to feel like we had the support going forward. And I was then asked to be on the board of directors of the 1994 Commonwealth Games, which gave me the ability to continue to you know, bring this issue forward and also to be a bit of a liaison between the commission uh, with the IPC and ongoing discussions with the Commonwealth Games Federation. And there's a question that it was uh, a bit of a foreign concept when we brought that forward. Uh, there was a lot of questions, concerns, and uh, diversity in opinion, as you can imagine, anytime you're trying to change the status quo. But uh, with perseverance and a lot of support uh, from you, from folks uh, inside the Canadian uh, Commonwealth Games Association and uh, other champions, eventually uh, we managed to gain that level of support. And I'll never forget the pride in knowing that the uh, Commonwealth Games Federation voted on this and uh, it was a significant majority of members who actually wanted this to happen. And probably the, the, the great reflection back on it is listening to Chantal Petitclair's testimony as having been a full medal participant in the Commonwealth Games in Manchester. And that was the first opportunity and, and she tended to classify her experience winning a gold medal in the Commonwealth Games as one of the great highlights of her athletic career. So a real source of pride in knowing that we were able to push the bar a little further to open up the continual opportunities for athletes with disabilities and a great reminder to the IPC that there are many ways in which we can serve athletes and create opportunities and reinforce the incredible excellence of athletes who happen to have disabilities who are demonstrating ability every single day. Thanks, Eli. Technology is great, isn't it? Yeah, until it's, until it's not. Um, so Dr. Sedward, I, I wanna pass it over to you, but just before I do that, I wanna try to couch a little bit about what Mr. Hansen said and um, get you to kind of fill in some gaps. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned at the outset, there were a parallel games to the Commonwealth Games going as far back as 1962. My understanding is that the, the, the person who started those games in Perth did so upon the consultation, the input um, through Sir, uh, Sir Ludwig Gutmann. And so there was that connection going back to the Stoke Manville Games. And so those first games, which were called the Paraplegic Empire Games in Perth, Australia, kind of set that ball in motion and then there was the I mean, i'm just sorry i got this straight 66 in kingston jamaica 1970 in edinburgh of scotland 1974 in dunedin new zealand and these paralleled the commonwealth games being held in other cities um but in the same country and then it stopped and my understanding too then is that again there was some you know discussion as to whether or not stoke manville should continue on with World Games, I believe the Fesbic Games, the, the Asian uh, paraplegic games actually were somewhat of a result of the end of the Commonwealth paraplegic games in 1974. But then there was a bit of a gap and it wasn't until 1990 when the Commonwealth Games were in Auckland, New Zealand, um, where it included, I think it was two wheelchair track events. And Baroness um, Tani Gray Thompson had, had connected with me, and I don't know if she's online with us today. She said that she might have had the possibility. I believe she competed um, in 1990 at these games in Auckland, as did Chantel Petitclair. Um, and it was interesting that Rick Hansen made mention of her in saying that her participation in the Commonwealth Games was the highlight, because I've also read that her participation in the Auckland Games was the low point in her competitive career, in part because of the lack of inclusion. Um, at those games in 1990. So Dr. Sedra, what I'm hoping where you kind of start the conversation and 
Rick made reference to CIAD, the Commission on the Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability, which I understand is something that you instituted when you were the founding president of the IPC, and Rick was the chair of that commission. Because it was in that time in the late 80s, early 1990s, when a lot of marathons, uh, the IAAF, were starting to include athletes with a disability. And I'm wondering if you can kind of fill in the gaps in between the end of the paraplegic uh, Commonwealth Games in 74, and then kind of when the inclusion started in the 1990 games, and then leading up to the 94 games in Victoria, where Rick Hansen made mention, he was involved in actually having athletes included. And then what we'll do is we'll recognize the gap between 94 and then 2002 in Manchester, and that's when Mary and David will start their conversation. So Dr. Sedgwick, can you, can you fill in that gap for us? Yes, well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll do my best, David. The, uh, of course, I always have to think back to the four uh, Commonwealth paraplegic games that were held between uh, 62 and 74. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Sir George Bedbrook, was the organizer out uh, out in Perth, and I spent a lot of time with him in the in the past. And he was very much devo devoted to the inclusion of uh, athletes, uh, particularly with spinal cord injuries, in in sport in Australia. And of course, those first four major paraplegic games were very much focused on the. Uh, Stoke mandible model because it was spinal cord injury. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that of those four different games, two of them were held before the Commonwealth Games and two of them were held after the Commonwealth Games. And we've always had that discussion as to when these, uh, when the, the Paralympics should be held before or after the Olympic Games uh, as well. So, so we did have a lot of integration uh, taking place, albeit in separate games, but sort of under a little bit of an umbrella uh, organization. Um, but then after, uh, after 74, of course, uh, the games were held in Christchurch, the Commonwealth Games, but the paraplegic uh, Paralympic or the paraplegic Commonwealth Games were held in Dunedin, so they weren't even in the same city, and that's when they sort of died off, I guess, a bit uh, uh, at that time. Now, seventy-eight and um, eighty-two, eighty-six. When you talk about Edmonton hosted seventy-eight, and then Brisbane, and then Edinburgh, etc. But there wasn't a, a very good relationship at the time between the Commonwealth Games Federation and then the International Coordinating Committee of Sport for Athletes with a Disability. Um, and in fact, uh, we had come under quite a bit of criticism because they, we didn't seem to have the credibility, the people didn't look upon us as really even having um, people who were athletes at all. So, as, so those games were, were a problem. And then certainly it was nice to revive it back when uh, in 90 when we went to uh, Auckland. And I remember being at those games. And I remember chatting with Chantel on occasion. And, and she was frustrated because uh, she wasn't part of the Canadian team. Uh, she even stayed in a different area. Uh, you know, it wasn't a, a medal that meant anything because there was no relationship between the me medal distribution of various countries. And then Rick has already made a point with regards to the uh, four years hence uh, after Auckland in Victoria. And then, uh, but then again, remember that in 94 uh, in Kuala Lumpur, there were no paraplegic uh, Commonwealth Games there. No, so that, was 90, that, that was 98, right? So 94 was Victoria and then 98 was Kuala Lumpur. And then 98 was Kuala Lumpur and there were no events that took place in Kuala Lumpur in uh, 98 and I remember being uh, at those games because I had a daughter at the time who was on Canada's national field hockey team so I spent quite a bit of time there and I was involved with the IOC at the at the time so I took with great interest but there just wasn't a strong interest in Kuala Lumpur and their organizing committee to, to host it. And there was no obligation to host it. Mm -hmm. So it was immediately following 
those games in in 98, but even leading up to them in 1990 at our general assembly, at the international IPC general assembly in uh, Berlin, uh, that's when I put these, uh, the Commission on Inclusion for Athletes with Disability in place with Rick uh, heading it up and having support uh, from Anne Merklinger uh, from On the Podium, as we all know very well. And so Rick started working very hard then, but we were really fortunate and uh, to have a lot of uh, exposure to the General Assemblies of the Commonwealth Games. They were very, uh, the Commonwealth Games Federation were, were very open-minded about inclusion. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know how it should happen. Mm -hmm. And we were also struggling, we being sorry, the IPC was struggling a bit too, because some of our members felt, well, if we take three sports for men and women and some events in swimming and track, et cetera, there'll be a lot that will be left out. And uh, therefore, maybe they should have all of the, the Paralympic sports embedded into the Commonwealth Games and not just select a few. So there was, right. we had our own internal challenges there to decide how that should happen. Because there that was a time of a lot of change. So as we made reference to Rick Hansen competing at the 84 games in Los Angeles in the Olympic games as a demonstration, if I recall, those are the very first demonstration events in the Olympic games. No, uh, Sarajevo in the winter. The winter. Right. Yeah. But that year was 80. So that 80, year. 84 yeah. that year was the first time that had happened. I mean, the IPC right. was only officially started in 89. Correct. Um, and so there was quite a, there was, I, I just think a lot of change taking place. Oh, uh, I mean, I think uh, after, uh, in fact, if we even go back, uh, David, to 1987 in March, when we hosted the, uh, uh, our, the famous Arnhem Seminar, when we had 210 delegates from 52 countries who came together to make multiple presentations over four days as to how we should organize sport in the world and of the 23 resolutions that were that were selected one of the key resolutions was integration right and uh within the able-bodied sport world in the international federations and uh and the olympics and that was strongly strongly supported and that's why after ipc created the first thing i got in place was the commission on integration so it was really a, a very strong and important aspect and the commonwealth games federation was the only international federation at the time to come forward to say let's sit down and talk and i have to give a lot of credit uh, and, and I know uh, David Grevenberg knows very well, Judy Kent from Canada was extremely supportive of that. And she was really, uh, she would drag Rick and I along to the meetings and, uh, and it came, uh, came through very loud and clear that they were prepared to do something. But what should it look like? What, what event should we have? And, and then we had strong support uh, from Tony Sainsbury in England uh, later on, of course, uh, when we went to Manchester. Uh, and, and I said, that's why uh, Chantel went from a low point in her history in 90 to 2002, 12 years later, to having one of her, one of her most precious medal winnings is that she won it in an integrated event as part of the Canadian team uh, and it was, uh, and as a result, when you think of the people like Tony and uh, and Judy, but more importantly, the open-mindedness of the Commonwealth Games Federation at the time to be willing to say yes, this is important. And well, and the last thing is is part of that is that the countries. We always know that in the Commonwealth Games, we've got very progressive countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and all of the UK countries, England, Scotland, etc., who were always good at promoting the inclusion of people living with a disability in sport and in society and education, etc., etc. So it was a natural to start it uh, there.
Okay, so before I pass it over to Mary and then uh, to David, again, I want, and you've, you've made reference to a meeting in Malta. Um, yes. Me anyways, with you and I believe Rick Hansen, which is where you presented to the Commonwealth Games Federation. So I'm just wondering if you can just fill in that little bit of a gap on why New Zealand, why Auckland decided to host those two events. And again, I think it's interesting because again, at that time, there was some criticism that why is it always the two wheelchair track events? What about other disability groups? What about other sporting events? Um, why is it always those two? And that continued, I believe, with the Olympic demonstration status events up until 2004, if not 2008 in Beijing. I can't recall specifically. Yes, yes. Um, but I want you to talk a little bit about those two events, how they got in Auckland, and then how kind of the inclusion happened at the Victoria Commonwealth Games. And then I want to pass it over to Mary to kind of then take that step to the Manchester Games in 2002. Wow. Well, uh trying to recollect the meetings and the people and how it all happened, but certainly we're building upon the success, of course, uh, of the inclusion in Los Angeles in the Olympics in 84. So we wanted to certainly build upon that. Uh, I think secondly, when we looked at our events, we wanted to look at events where we had the greatest number of participants from the greatest number of Commonwealth countries. Uh, we did not want to go the route of uh, team sports because in Commonwealth Games there weren't team sports. So what are the most largest participating sports in, uh, in the Commonwealth nation at the time? Was well, certainly athletics and swimming. And then we wanted to, but we wanted to build and get to three or four or five sports uh, if possible. So I think it was practical uh, that we, and we didn't want to, go into the Commonwealth Games Federation General Assembly and come up with some obscure uh, sport that, that the uh, athletes with disability weren't participating in. So we said, where do we have the most uh, disabled athletes and not just spinal cord, they had, they had to be you know, visually impaired amputees and, and other disabilities. And therefore that's when we started looking at the various countries, including some of the Asian countries like Kuala Lumpur and India, et cetera, to ensure that we had a good base of athletes so that the quality of competition was there. And once we showed the assembly in Malta, uh, gosh, I, I, my dates now, whether it was 99 or 2000, are in that neighborhood that we do have large participation and large participation at the elite level. Uh, it certainly demonstrated that they were keen to it because they could maintain that quality of competition and they could, hand, and they could handle it without dealing with, of course, with a team sport. Right, thank you. I recognize that I was your grad student in around 93 to 96. So that's probably why yeah. you have this dark cloud kind of. Uh, yes, because yes, yes. Well, there's no question about that because, uh, and that's why I spent a lot of time away from the university because a couple of the students that I had there were most difficult to manage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So 94 Commonwealth Games include athletes with disability. As we've already said, four years later, Kuala Lumpur, they decide to not do that. So there's a bit of a step back from an inclusion perspective. Four years following in 2002 in Manchester, England, they decide to make it official that athletes with a disability be included in the games. And it becomes the precursor for what we have today. So 2006, they are in Melbourne, 2010 in Delhi, and then 2014 in Glasgow, which is where David was the CEO of the Commonwealth Games there. And then most recently in the Gold Coast in 2000. 18 and they will be in 2022 in Birmingham. So I'd like now, if I may, Mary, if I can pass it over to you and you're going to moderate the conversation with David. Mary, over to you. All right, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Stedward, uh, for sharing your thoughts and your information. Great. It's always just great to hear it from someone who's been there, lived it, and someone of your, who was able to all those years put up with David Legg as a student. It's amazing. <laughs> you're welcome. Amazing. Thank, thank you for that support, Mary. You should put that on your CV somewhere, I think. Uh, <laughs> so David Grevenberg now, welcome. Um, it's good to be here. Yeah, and uh, I want to just do a brief introduction, reintroduction of you, and we've already said a little bit about your background, uh, but for the last you know, 
10 years, you've been with the Commonwealth Games. You've worked your way up from CEO of Glasgow 2014 to currently being the CEO of the Commonwealth Games Federation for the past few years. And of course, 10 years before that, you were with the International Paralympic Committee um, with uh, as a sport director and executive director. You, you've had a lot of honors. I got to throw these in. Most notably being named an honorary commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, a CBE. Congratulations on that for your services to uh, the, the uh, Commonwealth Games. And of course, you're in the Royal Scottish Geographical Society and all those good things. So lots of, lots of letters behind your name. I know you and your wife, Nanami, and your two children live just outside of Glasgow. In your spare time, I understand that you now have a brown belt in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. That's right. <laughs> I was a wrestler and now I'm, yes, uh, I'm, <laughs> taking my, I'm taking it a little bit easier with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So. <laughs> yeah. well, well, welcome and thank you for being here today and it's wonderful to see you. So I have a, just a few questions for you and of course, Dr. Stedder, please feel free at any time to jump in and address any of these questions. Um, so I'll start with one, uh, David, and that is just, if you could provide some background on the strategies, whether it's management strategies, philosophical strategies, whatever, that you used to make or people have used to make over the years to make the Commonwealth Games as inclusive as possible for athletes with disabilities. Well, I got, I got involved with uh, really uh, Paralympic sport uh, back, back in uh, 94, end of 94, and, and really started to um, realize, wow, this has just enormous potential. And I started off in, in the States, which had a, a big, I would say, philosophical divide on whether Paralympic sport was sport or was it just an opportunity for people with a disability uh, to be active. And really the lead up to Atlanta, a lot of points came to, I would say, to fruition that uh, we started to move towards a much more sport specific model where the whole concept of integration uh, into national governing bodies, joint events, joint uh, management of teams for a Paralympic team, an Olympic team, the whole equality agenda, which led to uh, of course, a, a big push on the Amateur Sports Act uh, in the U.S. to uh, have, and rightfully so, uh, the, the USOC at the time, and happily to see it as the USOPC uh, today, um, started to actually take their responsibility seriously in terms of uh, sport. But it still was very integrated and not inclusive. Um, and so really what I, I uh, had a, a number of uh, mentors, including Dr. Stedward, um, along the way, that really beat it into me <laughs> that, you know, on one side, um, you're only as disabled as the way you are treated, and you're um, only as disabled as your ability to adapt to your environment. And these are some of the valuable lessons I learned. So I said, if we treat people as people, or if we treat athletes as athletes, and we make an inclusive environment where people can easily adapt to, now we're talking about sport. Regardless of diversity, we're talking about sport. And so I took that philosophy um, and really looked uh, through a couple of different angles um, to legitimize uh, sport uh, for athletes with a disability. And, you know, which really, you know, which is now para sport, you know, to the point where we we actually transformed uh, the word para as, uh, as, um, as being um, of or associated with the Paralympic movement, you know, and that was, you know, that was a really instrumental part, but that was about really taking it from this notion of an add-on mm -hmm. to fully bona fide, legitimate part of um, the world of sport. And that was, a, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough, and I, I say this often, and David and I have spoken a number of times, and um, is that I was at the right place at the right time to be able to push some of these agendas. Um, and particularly with, uh, you know, Manchester, uh, I would, I'll never forget Tony Sansbury coming up to me um, just before Sydney and said, when we get to Sydney, we need to talk uh, about the Commonwealth Games. And as an American, I was like, the what? <laughs> all you need to know is that it's, uh, it's, uh, 
in the former British Empire. And I said, oh, okay, okay, whatever this is. And <laughs> so I did a little bit of research before I met with him. And uh, Peter Knowles, who was the sports director for Manchester and Tony Sansbury cornered me um, in Sydney in the village and basically said, we want 12 events, five sports, and these are the events we, we select and we want to showcase um, something just amazing. And so, and we want you to be the technical delegate. So I went back and <laughs> finagled my way with Dr. Bob and, and, and the uh, executive board who made me the technical delegate. Um, and I was responsible for getting these five sports, these 12 events up and running, which included, of course, the wheelchair racing events um, from, uh, from 94, but a slew of other events such as lawn bowls, which is a traditionally a, a, a Commonwealth sport. Um, and it was basically my responsibility was to minimize, minimize disruption and maximize profile benefit and impact. And so what I basically did was I spoke sport, spoke, uh, created uh, requirements that just legitimized our athletes as just legitimate athletes uh, uh, as part of the team and uh, the standards and the guidelines. We made it easy for the Commonwealth Games Associations because we did the first guidelines document, which was basically, you know, don't look at, you know, para sport or uh, at that time we called elite, elite athletes with a disability. Um, so it was, again, this was probably more of an integrated model to what we have now, which is much more inclusive. Um, but that it was a great start to to really open the eyes mm -hmm. of the world of sport in terms of both the legitimacy the prominence and the impact and manchester with with really due credit to the organizing committee uh had really used the association uh with uh teddy gray thompson as a local as a local hero and did a, an enormous amount of publicity around the importance of inclusion, which really set, set the tempo for their volunteer programs, set the tempo for not just on the field of play, but the whole ethos of the games themselves. Um, and they really took it, the, the, the notion of legacy uh, of those games in terms of the social legacy of those games was quite profound. Um, and that just set the success uh, both in terms of a broadcasting perspective, but also in terms of a reputational uh, perspective, set the bar so high um, in those games that you know really the rest is history. It, it became an integral part. Um, however, we needed to get the Commonwealth Games Federation to embrace a partnership with the IPC. And in, in the lead up to uh, Melbourne, there was no formal agreements, um, and that was a bit clunky. But uh, another successful event was was run in Melbourne in 2006. But by the time, but after those games, um, because of some of the, I would say, growing pains, um, a formal agreement in Sri Lanka in 2007, when Glasgow was uh, awarded the games, uh, I think the 3rd of November 2007, um, the IPC and the Commonwealth Games Federation signed a formal cooperative agreement for Delhi 2010 and Glasgow 2014, which allowed uh, the Commonwealth Games Federation to constitute para-sport events in the official program of the games. And that's what it, that was part of the negotiation and the deal. And, and Bob will remember, this was also the time we started to talk quite uh, quite actively around the transfer of governance of a number of IPC sports. Those are sports that were governed by the IPC. So the IPC, in addition to being uh, the the, uh, uh, the owner of the games, the the the, over, the uh, overseeing body for the Paralympic movement, was also the International Federation for 13 Sports. <laughs> so. You know, as being sports director, I still have uh, scars to show, <laughs> show for it. But um, it was a, it was an amazing, it was an amazing uh, point in time because the Commonwealth Games, and I think what was shown through those games, built an enormous amount of confidence 
in the potential of integration and then eventually inclusion of tr transferring uh, the, the, the governance of five sports from the IPC into the, into the international sport federations for those uh, specific, specific sports. So it's a very, I mean, I think the, 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 the Commonwealth um, uh, was very fortunate in terms of, uh, you know, embracing, embracing this when it did. And I think where, how it has acculturated and now where it really falls, I think it's a, a really symbiotic relationship in terms of, you know, we represent two thirds of the world's small states and island states. Uh, you know, one in every third person in the world is a Commonwealth citizen. We have the, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges and uh, reality of a, a shared history that's very complex. Um, and so there's different perspectives of ability, different perspectives of equality across, you know, our island states, our small states, uh, our, our emerging and developed states. Um, and it's really, it's really, this is a component that is, I would say, embraced now as really part of a family. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really a large credit to the, the early work that was done in 1994 in particular, uh, that really gave the confidence to Manchester to really take it on the road um, in uh, 2002. Well, and, and, you know, as we're talking about the history and what leads us up to now, let me shift gears here for just a couple of minutes. I know we're going to take questions shortly to the future. And that is looking ahead to Birmingham 2022. And I saw just last week where the, the organizers published their accessibility and inclusion commitment, which included this following statement. I'll read just for a second. It says Birmingham 2022 is proud to be hosting the Commonwealth Games. The 2022 competition will include the largest integrated parasport program along with the most women's events in the history of the movement. The commitment outlines a strategic approach, which will embed accessibility and inclusion within our sports programs, planning processes, organizing committee, and the games as a whole. So just given that statement, which is, like I said, I think it was last week that was put out. Um, could you elaborate on what exactly uh, accessibility and inclusion means what, for this event, what it would look like, maybe also for other major sporting events? Um, and the strategies that would be needed to operationalize accessibility and inclusion going forward. Well, I really, I mean, this, there's, we're in the business of creating people's proudest moments. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I recall um, how we wanted, the experience we wanted to deliver in Beijing, for example, was we want to treat people with dignity. We want to allow them to enjoy themselves independently. And we want to create an experience that is once in a lifetime world class. And so, if you focus on those kind of principles in terms of the experience of a games, um, it you know that that's that's a, it's a, it, it really you know if it ticks all the boxes, every moment when you're planning flows into a venue to the experience on the field of play to the experience in a village or um, or the sights and sounds of a city in terms of points of interest or, or uh, live sites or, festi or the festival atmosphere. If you take those pieces, regardless of the diversity, whether it's moms with prams, whether it's a person using a wheelchair, whether it's a person with a visual impairment, you really empathize and then, and then create an experience and make sure that you've really you, you know, uh, done what you can. What I have been really promoting over the past couple of years, uh, probably the really in the lead up to Glasgow was this notion of you can go for that experience and that can be a, you know, a great uh, barometer and ideal but ultimately what you 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 need to do first and foremost is create an environment that exercises its duty of care so the language that you use 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 the imagery that you use the um you know, from the website to uh, everything, to, to uh, how you describe uh, your ambition really has to show a sign of respect and protect the interest of, of people. And I think that's something, you know, regardless of whether it's uh, ability or gender or race or, uh, you know, 
religious uh, uh, belief or orientation, uh, you name it. Um, if you focus on respect and protect in everything that you do in delivering that experience I was saying, you're off to the right start. What, what organizers often do is focus on promote and empower before they've respected and protected. And so what I've learned over the, the, the past several years in running major uh, events is that you have to exercise your duty of care before you're actually able to harness the opportunity. And at the end of the day, you're there to recognize and remember as well. So uh, there's a continuum that we've created in the Commonwealth uh, sport movement, which really focuses on respect, protect, promote, empower, uh, recognize, remember. And that really, all those elements, you know, create something for everyone uh, and ultimately experience that transcends generations and really makes people feel like they're included, that they're valued, and that they, that they have access to something that's a moment in time that's ultimately the place to be. So whether it's para-sport or whether it's uh, um, another genre of diversity, <laughs> <laughs> we try to create an inclusive environment, and that's what we're, you know, we've, we've been refining that really since Glasgow through Gold Coast and now on to Birmingham and beyond. <laughs> and beyond. Well, that's, I, I need to zoom you into my sport management classes so they could, our, our students and our future sport managers can hear those thoughts as well. That would be great. Now, Eli, Eli, and uh, I think it's, we're supposed to turn things over for questions yeah. now, Eli. So I'm going to kind of pivot over to you uh, for doing that part, David. Thank you. Excellent. Uh -huh. Thank you. Really wonderful presentations and conversations so far. And we're going to turn it over into the Q the Q and A. Well, I guess before we turn it over to some of the comments that we've seen, I, I wanted to pose a question um, for us on the on this conversation, and that has to do with a committee for inclusion, disability inclusion today. I know there was one in the past, and you know, and there was the timeliness of that, but then, and I, I just was curious your thoughts about the timeliness of something like that today. You know, do we need a, a sort of a committee for disability inclusion in sport today? Um, so I thought I'd ask to Dr. Studward and also to David, and given all the other things going on around race and gender and sexual orientation, which are getting a lot, you know, does disability inclusion need something like that or, or maybe something else? But would love to hear your, your comments and, and just to have that conversation briefly. And then we're going to go into the others. So it's okay to keep the response short. Just your, your initial reactions or thoughts is okay. I'll let Dr. Stebbard start. <laughs> sure, David. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Eli, that's, that's, an un, that's a great, great question. Um, back uh, 30, 30 years uh, ago, we lived in a completely different uh, environment in sport. Uh, and of, of course, we were just so driven at the time because we were such a mere fledgling caught within the superstructure of sport and we were lost and, and we wanted to fight for our rights and our recognition. So we felt the way we could do it would be to formalize a commission to look at at integration, whether you, no matter your disability, no matter the severity of your disability, no matter whether you're male, female, it didn't matter. The, the principle was find a way to include our athletes within the normal realm of global sport in the world. Um, and that happened uh, and is conti and continued to happen but I think now we're living in a much more, uh, in a different world today than we did 30 and 40 years ago. And uh, David is certainly living it within the Commonwealth Games Federation, and perhaps he's in a better position now to reflect on how do we deal with these current issues uh, that we're dealing with over the past month, and how, does, how do we pull that in to so that our so that people with disability can also uh, have opportunities of being included within society with and through sport. That was amazing. The response on tennis, 
you know, just in the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. Yeah, I, that was amazing. The response. I can't believe that. That's uh, just a quick example. Uh, yeah. That the tennis event would even allow yeah. them not to participate to begin with. I don't know what they were thinking of. But the response. And so, yeah, David, yeah. thank you, Dr. Stone. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's, you know, I, I think, you know, as Dr. Sedwood rightfully said, we, we have come a long way. Um, we've come a long way uh, in terms of, I think, people being legitimized by the, in the eyes of others and people feeling legitimized uh, in their own right. And I think, uh, I mean, I know uh, Eli and Mary, we used to debate all the time about inclusion um, versus integration. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there was a time, I remember, uh, you know, working on the coordination in both Sydney and in uh, Athens uh, in, you know, the wheelchair exhibition events. And I basically remember really challenging our athletes uh, at the time and said, you know, saying to those athletes, you know, who were participating and who were fortunate enough to participate in those events, I don't ever want you to feel like second class citizens. Tokens, yeah. you know, and so it was almost the point of well, it's better to be here than not to be here. I said, well, then don't complain. Then. <laughs> I said, if you don't mind being a second class citizen, <laughs> but it's just an exhibition event and it's just a medal. And I said, we're at that point, and of course, we're at we were at the point of, you know, and so it was a bit of a stand. Is that well, you can't get all the the, the prestige and the and, and and everything, and not legitimize this. So it was almost counterintuitive. It was almost devaluing the brand of Olympics at the time. Right. However, we move that on now. And athlete commissions, integrated organizing committees, which uh, or, or with a really inclusive environment, uh, and culture. Culture is the key. You know, long gone, I think, are the days of the, the patriarchal hierarchies. They're, they're, they're dying fall, they're, they're dying hard now, and they're gonna fall hard. And I really think that what we're finding now is sport, because we're so much more accountable and connected because of uh, these wonderful things and this wonderful <laughs> uh, uh, medium, is that it's having to work in what's really called um, an adhocracy or an autocratic uh, mindset, which is much more um, organic and in the way that we are uh, delivering, the way that we gr put groups together to tackle specific problems and innovate. And so you need the right people around the table to attack uh, a particular issue. And the more diversity that you have around that mm -hmm. table, the more perspective you bring to solving a future proofing solution. And so I dare I say is that what we should be focusing is on more diversity, much more diversity. And so for example, we have in our athletes commission, whilst we have regional representation, we also have uh, para sport representation because it's it's important um, and in, in the in, in, uh, great representative Natalie de Troyes, who's competed in both uh, a number of able-bodied uh, uh, sport uh, uh, events, um, and of course, para sport events as well. So, excellent. Eli, I, for that, yeah, David, let me turn to you. And, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna try. I'm going to try and tie in some of the other comments and the questions mm -hmm. with one final question. So we we have eight minutes left. So Julia asked the question from uh, from the United States perspective. She's looking at track and field. Like what, you mm -hmm. know, what defines a, an attractive event um and then dom asked the question about you know how does bocce get included into a games and i i recognize that birmingham has the largest number of events for athletes with a disability in the commonwealth games history so it's continued to grow and we've gone through the evolution what's what's next what's the next big step that the commonwealth games takes as it relates to inclusion of athletes with a disability, whether or not it's the addition of sports like a bocce, uh, whether it's you know identifying these key ingredients that are successful events that excite athletes and excite spectators, what's the big giant leap that the Commonwealth Games takes? I know that you know a city has not been chosen for the 2026 games or the 2030 games. 
where where do we see this going as far as an evolution as far as a life cycle of an organization and a movement well this will probably send shockwaves around the world but i would i would say if i had to i'll start with the latter versus the, the former uh from, from what i can see and i think sport innovation is critical right now and i think one of the things i would love to see is a mixed gender mis mixed ability mm -hmm. team events you know, and I think that provides some real excitement, um, you know, symbolically, but also just visually could be quite compelling. And you, you've got wonderful opportunities and relay events. Um, and, you know, the, the, the big thing is safety, fairness, and universality. If you're looking at the quality of events, you know, is that you need to ensure that all the participants are safe, all, uh, that fairness prevails, um, and each sport it has a different perspective on, on fairness and that you have universal representation. Um, you know, the, the question on a quality of event, from my perspective, you know, we focus so hard on numbers because it's easy to uh, discriminate <laughs> constructively, but easily to basically say you don't meet the threshold, therefore you're not in. And we only have so much time, so much space, um, etc. So it's that notion of you know, being able to actually get the best um, representation of what you have, uh, <laughs> universal, uh, within the certain, within your, you know, cutting your cloth accordingly, but at a quality level that is also going to entertain and be fulfilling and legitimate for the athletes. And if it's just me against uh, a person I run against all the time in a race, great we tick the box in terms of a class being represented but the spectators and the people that are participating actually don't get the true potential so when we're working with the sports and we're working with the countries to devise uh those events we need to take into account all of these elements and it's not easy but we have to make difficult difficult decisions because one we can't be everything to everybody um this is reality we only have so much time, so much, um, uh, so much, so much resources in terms of, but not not just finance, but 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 also support. Um, and at the end of the day, if we're trying to create that dignified, independent, once in a lifetime, world class experience for everyone, we have to do it uh, according to a plan, and uh, you know, do it do it to the best of our ability. So it's yeah, it, that's that's probably. Uh, you know, the, the, the probably the shortest way I could answer the, <laughs> the question of quality. That's really good, thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. Now, we're almost out of time, and I, we always like to give Dr. Stedward the final word. Um, they, are, they are the Stedward talks, after all. Um, so, Dr. Stedward, any final words of uh, summary, uh, general advice to me personally? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've given up on giving advice to you, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I just I want to re and uh, just say thank you to everyone for participating. I I think the idea, David, that you had and Eli in the past to to do these talks, I think, is great. I, I've enjoyed them so much uh, over the last three, and I hope they continue with other topics like we have. But today is really interesting because i mean inclusion was really important to the newly created paralympic movement uh back in the 80s very very important because we were we seemed to be the poor cousins left behind but also thing li life the world is changing it's never with this pandemic going forward, sport is not going to be what it once was. And I think we're going to have to really look at the structure and governance and delivery of sport, health, fitness, lifestyle in this world much differently. I mean, we see it already. Look at the, the surgence of e-sport coming up. And, and, uh, and I see, well, maybe in the future, we will no longer have an example, downhill skiing, because you only see the person for a split second. 
uh, and yet you can have competitions with and between men and women coming down two at a time, four at a time, eight at a time, right in front of you. Things are, you know, the world is changing and young people, you know, as David Grevenberg said, you know, they've got this and this kind of situation, it's going to be different and we better be ready for what's going to happen in the future and we better start preparing for it today. All said, Dr. Shedrin. To conclude, I want to thank uh, certainly the members of the organizing group, Eli, Mary, and, and Ted Faye, who wasn't able to be with us today, just had knee surgery. Um, I want to certainly thank our speakers. Uh, David, Dr. Stedward, thank you so much for joining us. And if I can, if I may, uh, a bit of a promo for future Stedward talks. So on July the 30th um, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the United States, uh, we've got Gudrun, Dr. Gudrun Doltepper uh, from Berlin who will be zooming in. We're gonna talk about the history of Olympic and Paralympic integration and focusing on ICSPE, which is the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, and IFAPA, of which I'm the president now, and she was the president from 1993 to 1995, and that's the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. We are also working on two others in the fall. One is gonna be on sitting volleyball, the history of sitting volleyball, and the second is gonna be on the history of sledge hockey, or now para ice hockey. Is it sledge or sledge? Yeah, sledge or sledge, that's right. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for attending the third Sedward Talks. Have a great remainder of your Thursday, and we look forward to seeing you on July 30th. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you, David Grevenberg. Okay. It's great to see you, Bob. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Yeah.